It's in every millennial's dream to own a side hustle. The truth is, most eight to five jobs don't pay the bills. When you look at your rent, when you look at your transportation, when you look at food, your clothes, you're barely left with nothing. And this is why many millennials have turned to side hustle. This is Founders Connect Africa. Hi, how are you? Is this Trendy B Fashion? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, maybe you can uh, give me what you guys do. I'm seeing very good fabrics here. Yes, yes. I'd like to have a shot. On this episode, we feature Nahulo Kaimia Natabona, a marketing and communications manager in a global communications company in Nairobi. When she is not running around boardrooms, Nahulo is here designing clothes, fulfilling her passion. Hello. Hey, how, how are you? Good. Good, good to good see you. Thing. Good to see you. Good, good. It's been a long time. Thank you so much. You yes. know, it's lunch hour, and, <laughs> and this is now the time I do yeah, you other come stuff. Back. Okay. Because uh, okay. I don't want to use my company. Your company time. time. <laughs> yeah, so Thank you so much. It's my time to do things. Yeah. We've been waiting. Kalibu, Kalibu. 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 Welcome to Trendy B Fashion House. Yes, I really love this. Uh, uh -huh. Trendy B Fashion House. Yes. It's lunch time, and I'm not seeing any food here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's lunch time, you know, I had to rush here to get to see what my team is doing. Because yes, yes. you see, we uh, at work we have two hours, between mm. midday and two o'clock. Mm. So those two hours, instead of just sitting in the office or hanging around, yeah. I dedicate at least three times a week to just come to the shop so that I get to see what is happening, any update, any pending issue. Yeah. Uh, is there a client that wants something to be... And then you know there are clients that are very particular. Yes. So I try to create time for them during that hour. So yeah. I, I'm always eating on the go, either when I'm, I'm coming or when yeah. I'm leaving yeah. or eat when I'm now working, when I'm back at work because I have to be at work by 2 p.m. So that I don't eat into my employer's wow. time. Interesting. We're going to come back to how you juggle that because I, th I see it's a bit of um, it's, it's a bit of a story there. Yes. Let's go from the beginning. Let's start yes. from the beginning. How did you start 20B? When did you start it? Um, were you employed then when you were starting? Um, just give us a, 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 a short background about Trendy okay. B Fashion House. Now, Trendy B Fashion House, how it started, I think I'll take it back to like over 10 years ago, yeah? yeah. People used to love how I dress. Mm. People used to see me wearing, and it was just normal, as in like you just dress up and guys are like, wow, I just love your style. I would love you to dress me and stuff like that. So I started uh, buying Mutumba stuff. Then I was I was staying in Umoja Estate next wow. to Mutindwa. Uh -huh. So I'll go to Mutindwa Market, mm -hmm. shop some stuff for guys in the office, mm. and then come and sell to them. But it got to a point where guys were taking stuff on credit. Mm. And I was like, no, this one, it, it's not going to work. Mm. As much as it's passionate, as much as I had passion for, uh, for fashion, but mm. I was like, why can't I do something that in the long run will give me money? Mm. Yes. Have, have you been to design school? No, I haven't been to a design school, but I would love, love to go to a design school, yeah? So that I just get to learn the nitty gritties of the yeah. fashion design and stuff yeah. like that. But I've gone for some few basic pattern uh, making classes where so that I just get to learn mm. what is a bodice, what is a, a waistband, mm. what is you know all those mm. uh, nitty gritties, the yeah. words in the in the tailoring yeah. uh, whatever industry. Now I see that you have a lot of designs here. I see a lot of clothes here. Mm. How much did you invest in the project? Okay, uh, I wouldn't <laughs> really really say that I, I invested quite some. I, yes, I took a loan. Yeah. yeah? yeah. And before I started here, I, I started in a small, I started in a smaller space mm. before I grew into now a bigger space and getting more customers. Mm. So my business totally relies on the customers. So when the customers come and whatever capital I get, let me tell you the truth, up to now it's been five years, mm -hmm. I've not been able to pay myself. I'll be lying if I told you that wow. I'm, I'm paying myself. Wow. Because all the money that comes in yeah. from the customers, I inject it into the, into the business. Because I want it to grow and become something else, yeah? So my starting capital was roughly like 500,000. That was around uh, in 2015, just to kick off this. Yeah, because you need machines, you need fundies, you need uh, fabrics, you need permits and all those things. Yeah, and paying rent and stuff like that. How many uh, shops do you have? Apart from, I know this is where now people come and get yes. 
um, measured and stuff, and they come. You have you have meetings with your clientele here. Do you have a, a space where you literally sell yes. um, your products? So our South B Center, which is now here, where we are here, this yes. is where we do all the consultation. Mm. This is where we do made to measure. So made to measure is whereby you come, we do your fitting, because there are specific outfits that mm. you cannot just randomly say this is a size 10, this is a size 12, oh, yeah? yeah? You have to take the exact measurements and then all the consultation is done here. And then now uh, we have Village Market, we yes. are opposite Carrefour yeah. in a Zanta Dede stores, okay. where that is whereby we've partnered as a fashion designers in the country mm. and come up with a space where we sell jewelry, mm. outfits, that is men's wear, yes. kids wear, women's wear, as in it's like, a mini a supermarket, of, yes, yes, at the village, foods, yeah. yes. Yeah. And then I have another store in town yeah. whereby I sell now, because I try to differentiate my clientele, yeah? The village market clientele are totally different from the town clientele. Mm -hmm. So the town clientele, I try to come up with stuff that suits that clientele mm -hmm. in town, yeah? So we are based at Imenti House. Mm -hmm. So at Imenti House, there's another other smaller child of mine called Twenty B Duka. Mm. So the reason why I differentiated it from here it's because now this one it's technically just fashion. Mm. But Twenty B Duka is to incorporate other products mm. that it's all about beauty and fashion. Mm. So anything to do with skincare, anything mm. to do with hair products, yes. anything to do with jewelry. So mm. you'll find it at the Twenty B Duka. I want it to go to the next level whereby I can be able to have outlets across the country. Mm and even have a website where anybody can shop. Mm -hmm. I have global clients that mm -hmm. come in, they check out my Instagram pages and Facebook pages and pick some stuff, mm -hmm. but I want it to be like a global fashion house, mm -hmm. yeah? And I want maybe in the next five years, God help me mm -hmm. if I can transition from my eight to five, because I know if I was to sit here mm -hmm. every day to be my eight to five job, yeah. I really, really make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So my prayer is just to grow Trendy B Fashion House to the next level. You come here in the next five years, yes. you'll see a whole lot of difference. Yes. Or maybe even I would have moved out of this space <laughs> to another space. Yeah. What has been your serious challenges? Wow, the industry <laughs> has so many challenges. Mm -hmm. One is the tailors. Mm -hmm. Tailors can drive you crazy. Let, tell me about it. Tell, yes. tell me about it. You, know? you see, people always assume that when you're running a fashion house, as in you are expected to be top notch. That's mm -hmm. why you'll find people complaining on social media. I made this outfit, but it did not come out the way I wanted. wanted. But you see me as the fashion house owner, I'm yeah. also feeling the pain. Yes. Yeah. Because you have to make sure that the tailors do the perfect job. Mm -hmm. Before we go ahead and make, and that's why now the process is quite expensive. So when you hear someone saying an outfit is going for 10,000, 15,000, yes. there's a lot of work that is done mm. behind the scenes, yeah? Because yeah? yeah. we'll always come up with a sample. Mm. Remove, mm. stitch, do this, stitch, mm. yeah? And then until now it fits, it's perfect fit. That's when now we tell the, the, the whatever, the customer to come yeah. check it out. Yeah. If she loves it now, that's when now we go ahead now and do the cutting. Okay and now doing the final stitching of the outfit for the client. So those are for the complicated designs. Okay. Yes. So tailoring is, is a huge problem, what else? It's a huge ta problem, yeah? Second is the imitation in the market. You, you come up with a design, you love it and stuff like that. And then now uh, someone posts on social media and someone asks and then you're like, no, that is too expensive. That person takes the same, no. same design to the river road, uh, Taylor. Taylor, yes, so also that one has uh, really, yeah, really affected yeah, yeah. Yeah, the market, exactly. The market. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think with time, and then also people are not really, really into, because based on what people have experienced with mm -hmm. tailors, now they do not have confidence with the fashion industry. Because okay. you've gone to a tailor, he's messed up your outfit mm -hmm. once, twice, three times, you're like, you know what, I'd rather just go get something from Dubai or yeah. go to to Moy Avenue so not, and not, not, nothing, exactly nothing yes yeah. so you rather do that so that is also one of the challenges I yeah. think you also went through that uh, there's a shot that I, I got a fabric and mm. I had this design what came out it was something else. Yeah. yeah and it was a present for someone so they've never worn it till today so yeah. yeah so now that is also a challenge in terms of clientele yes once they it's been ruined they already have that perception about tailors so them coming, it's something else, yeah? So that is another challenge. And then another challenge is basically for me having 
eight to five job mm. is management. Mm. Yeah, because you see now, I really, really need to be on top of things. Yes. And I really, really need to manage, not micromanage my team, mm. but try as much as I can to manage my team. Mm. What motivates you that always, that you've never, it's been five years, you haven't gotten back your investment, investment. Yeah. but you're still doing it even now? You know, what I makes think, you wake up every day and say, I have to do this, I have not to give up? I think yeah. I don't I don't like letting down people. Mm. Yeah, it's there's a time I was like, do I really need to do this? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> do I really as in like Is it not a ex sense? Yes. <laughs> and then I sit back, think yeah. about how far I've come mm. and I'm like, you know what, you cannot do this. Mm. Look at my customers, the ones that they repeat customers. Yeah. I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to let them down. Mm. Look at the people who just gas me up on social media and they're mm. like, you're doing it. Even if they're not buying, you know, at the end of the day, it's not all about just people buying your stuff mm. that you're like, they motivate you. There are people who will just gas you up on social media and they're like, you're doing well, just mm. continue. You, yes, so that's what, and then I'm so passionate about fashion mm. because this is what, as in, if I could eat, drink, sleep, this is where I'll yes. do it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things, first and foremost, is um, how well does she understand the market that she's dealing with uh, in terms of she came up with a product, there are, some, there are people who like it, and uh, it's important to know so first and foremost, are we clear about who it is who buys from her, um, what they're able to afford, and then number three, are they many enough that uh, in their buying cycles would enable her to be uh, profitable, yeah? Because maybe she needs to sell to a thousand every month to become profitable, mm -hmm. I don't know. We would need to look at her, the details of her books. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe she needs to play around with the pricing so because you know, maybe her market is very exclusive uh, and exclusive markets tend to be very brand conscious so she has to put a lot of effort into building the brand and then mm -hmm. pricing it accordingly so that when she sells X number of units, mm -hmm. it's able to pay for high expenses and uh, able to also uh, return a profit to her. Mm -hmm. So it will be very important that she starts to look at the numbers uh, and her database of clients or the clientele who walk into her shops and ask herself, are these, is it a big enough market to, to, to make me profitable? Mm -hmm. That's uh, a very big question that she needs to ask herself. Um, I think when it comes to copycats, uh, the, the, the bigger challenge here could be that the focus has really been just on the product and not necessarily the entire business model. So uh, she has great products and the fact that people are copying them is a good thing. It shows that there is something in there. But is there a clientele that is very conscious about getting the original product? Uh, and can she grow the clientele that want the original product to a place where they are critical enough mass to keep her profitable? Uh, the people doing knockoffs, there could be several options there. She could think about a sep uh, another brand that, you know, maybe builds uh, products that fit the pricing of, uh, of that particular market and then she could end up serving two markets. So like a, a high-end brand for the premium people and another brand that serves the not so premium uh, market. And then number three is that her business model shouldn't just be about the products themselves. It should also be about how she engages the people. Uh, can she build, say, a club of the people who consume her product and build certain things around it that build brand loyalty. Maybe it could be exclusive events. It could be, um, you know, uh, how she sends certain tips around the use of her products or around fashion mm -hmm. on email or on WhatsApp or, you know, like some communication that goes on even when people are not with her. Um, building a relationship um, beyond people coming into her shop. And this is where I always tell people databases are very, very important. Make sure that you have a connection with your customer beyond them walking in. Make sure you have their contacts, their email address, their phone number, and find ways of engaging them, you know, over and beyond uh, just the interaction uh, in your shop. Uh, and that additional engagement could build loyalty 
where people even feel guilty if they were to go and buy the knockoffs and that kind of thing. And knockoffs in the fashion industry is actually, uh, you know, part of the game. So you have to always find a way of staying ahead of the car of the curve. Um, and you know. The way I've seen fashion cycles, people usually do cycles according to seasons. For us, it's cold and hot season. Uh, we don't have too many of those. But she could actually build fashion cycles around that and then have sales, aftermarket sales that, you know, she's able to sell the remaining products that are not able to, to sell. So there's a lot she can consider around her business model to make sure that she locks in her customers and to her brand as well. Mm. I think one of the most crucial things she can do is have somebody who keeps her books. Uh, and this can be maybe a side hustler like herself, somebody who's a very competent accountant, uh, because I suspect that, you know, maybe she doesn't have too many transactions to deal with. Mm -hmm. And she could outsource that function for a certain fixed fee every month mm -hmm. for somebody who comes, takes the receipts and all the records and puts together her books and then is able to give her mm -hmm. what we call management accounts so that she can be able to see, am I making a profit or not? Where am I spending? Uh, a lot of my costs, are there costs I can cut, are there uh, expenses I can reduce to make myself more profitable or do I need to actually change my pricing. Um, there's actually quite a bit to, to, to the data that, that, that she can get, especially if say her clients pay by M-Pesa. Uh, that is also good enough data to show the cycles within which her customers buy. Do they buy once every month or every two months? Then she'll know if it's once every two months, she probably needs double the number of customers so that every month she has the same, you know, a similar number of, of customers. But uh, there's a lot of people who are able to do outsourced accounting where all you need to do is make sure that the people who are working in her shops keep the records and then somebody comes and puts them together into books um, and you, she'll get a lot of insights I can guarantee out of that kind of process.